Hi, this is Tracy Tagahama Espinosa, and today we're going to be looking at the role of emotions and decision making. To do this, we're going to start off with looking at some definitions of emotions, the history of the study of emotions, consider the role of emotions in all aspects of our lives, including key roles in decision making, and then look at some key theories of decision making that have been around for a few centuries but still have influence today. And then we're going to consider the concept of universal emotions. Are there things that all people uh, experience. Uh, to do this, we're also going to contextualize the idea of emotions being different from feelings and to try to understand which of those is actually manipulable, which of those things can we actually control. Can you control your emotions or can you control your feelings? That will dovetail into part two, which has to do with emotional intelligence. So let's start off with those definitions. First, we know that emotions really comes from the Latin word, which means to put or put something into motion, to make something move into action, which is kind of interesting if you think about it. Um, every single emotion that you experience actually pushes you in one direction or another to take some kind of action. So there's a big difference here between emotions and feelings from uh, Antonio Damasio's perspective. Antonio Damasio is one of the leading experts in this area of emotions or the study of emotions and feelings and how they drive decision making. And he basically says that emotions are what your body can't help but experience um, due to the sensory perceptions. You receive some kind of stimulus from the outside which makes you, uh, your body react in a certain way through a certain chemical change or, or impulse, okay? But what you feel is something that you have filtered based on your own past experience. You can actually interpret the feeling or you change the way you actually feel about things. This is actually why through therapy, for example, some people uh, may never be able to relieve themselves or get rid of an emotion, a specific emotion, but they can change the way they choose to react. For example, you might have a, a panic of standing up and speaking in public, right? that rush you get when that adrenaline hits your bloodstream and you just want to run <laughs> from the scene. Well, the idea is that that's not going to go away. But Damasio says that maybe you can learn to harness that and, and embrace that and say, okay, I'm going to use this to my benefit. It's going to help me focus better. I'm going to speak uh, clearly. I'm going to uh, focus myself differently. Basically, it's harnessing that emotion, identifying what that emotion used to make you feel, break that connection and create a new feeling related to the emotion. So that's basically how therapies work, right? So the idea here is to understand there's a difference. Emotions themselves are things that we probably are not going to be able to change because of physiological reaction, but feelings are things that we can reinterpret in our daily lives. So emotions are automatic, whereas feelings are things that are conditioned based on the way we've experienced or reacted to those emotions in the past. So as emotions are reactions to external stimuli, so you learn about your world, right, through all of your, your sensory perceptions, right, you interpret your world, you have an emotion, and then you have to uh, react to it with a feeling, but that feeling comes from the way that you've experienced things in your past. So based on those conditioned responses, you actually feel feelings, but you can change those feelings as well. So what is the history of the study of emotions or emotional intelligence? Charles Darwin actually began in 1868 and wrote that the expression of emotions in man and animals uh, was a theme that he looked at, trying to understand if there were emotions that were shared between species. Uh, Thorndike talked about intelligences and its uses and included the role of emotions in that intel those types of intelligences. Weschler talks about the influence of non-intelligence factors. So this is the famous Welsher test, right? When you have intelligence tests, basically looking at emotional influences on your behavior or on intelligent behavior. This was followed by Lerner in uh, 1966, and he was the first to coin this term of emotional intelligence. This became really popular in, in the 80s. Howard Gardner never talked about emotional intelligence, but he talked about the role of multiple intelligences, right? And this was followed by Payne's doctoral thesis, which was a study of emotions and the development of emotional intelligence. This is the first mention in literature, uh, in modern literature, about this uh, concept and how it actually influenced your your reaction to your world, um, not only in academic sense, but in social sense. Then Greenspan really picked up on this and offered some of the first models we have of emotional intelligence and some of the first guesses at how to actually measure this. And Salovey and Meyer actually came up with some of the best, and actually still use today, some of the best measures of emotional intelligence, so um, actual tests to try to measure something that was before considered intangible. Then Goldman really made this uh, super popular with his book on emotional intelligence and emotional intelligence in schools and emotional 
emotional intelligence in, in uh, businesses. And so we've uh, spread this out to actually be something of, of popular culture, not just something that was studied in the academic world. And then the bar on test is actually another tool, another instrument that's been used recently to actually try to measure uh, advances in emotional intelligence based on um, developmental stages of an individual. So let's look at this and, and try to get you to reflect a teeny bit. True or false? Reasoning and decision making can be divorced from emotions, and in doing so, people make better decisions. Have you been told that before? Have you been told, no, no, have a cool head, you know, think about this calmly, you're, you're bound to make a better decision. First of all, is that even possible? What we know from now from more modern studies is that the way information reaches your brain makes that actually impossible to do. Even though you might try to you know, rein in those emotions, basically this is physiologically impossible. We know that there is a direct link between emotions and decision making and the way that information sensory perceptions enter your brain, it's actually impossible to bypass this first filter of emotional response. So no, we know that emotions are critical to decision making in all aspects of life. And decisions are, are what we choose to pay attention to, what's important. Uh, also, learning. You cannot learn without making decisions. So basically, the neural pathways for all new learning cannot help but first pass through the amygdala for a first check, which is an emotional memory check. So there's no way that you can make a decision without the influence of emotions, even though it sounds like a good idea. So why are they important? Emotions prepare us for specific reactions. So from a psychological perspective, we think that, you know, emotions are actually these reflections of the feelings that we're having. So we're connecting that physiological response, the emotion, to different feelings that might be related to other past events that we've had and that we might need to recondition ourselves to react in a different way in the future, okay? So if we connect all of these different things, um, let's look at it in a different way. Early experiences with emotions, with the way you feel. For example, if uh, as an infant you have this loving, warm feeling when you see your mother, but what happens is that when mom approaches, she smacks you or, or hurts you in some way, right? You begin to reinterpret what you presumed was this face, this connection here, in a different way. So the emotion that you first had, this loving feeling, is now linked to being beaten. Okay, so some people get used to that and they think that, okay, love equals being hit <laughs> because that's something that they've had uh, occur to them over and over and over again. So we know that the role of early experiences does have a huge influence of the way we interpret these emotions and how we feel about things. And this makes it harder and harder and harder because if they're habituated over so much time, to break those links uh, in that connection in your brain is very, very hard in order to be able to create or construct new connections about what is a positive way to react to that loving feeling as opposed to the negative reaction that you've built up over several years. So you have to be able to make this break and then you have to make this new connection. So all of us have a fear of angry faces, but children who have that connection to a behavior of actually being abused or hit they uh, have a much stronger reaction to those negative faces as well. So how does this, what does this mean for emotions and decision making? We know that emotions are critical to decision making and there's no such thing as a decision independent of an emotional interpretation, whether or not that's conscious to you or not, okay? And we also know that negative emotions and stress due to the combination of neurotransmitters in your brain, that can actually impede new learning because you can't make a decision when you're, you become paralyzed, right, uh, with your actions. There's a, a sidebar here that has to do with the role of uh, dreaming. A lot of you might be interested in this study of, you know, what's the role of dreaming? We still don't know, right? There's a lot of theories out there, but some of them that are really, really fascinating. Uh, for example, uh, Alan J. Hobson at, at Harvard had this idea that uh, dreams provide a space for us to practice our emotions. So we really need to practice. We need to know how exactly to react to that person who approaches us in one way. We need to be able to defend ourselves if necessary. We need to be able to uh, embrace and hug that person when we get the right uh, cue from them. But we don't have a lot of time to do that in real life, right? When, in real life situations. So he proposed that maybe we're using um, dream time as a good role for practicing emotions, which is why we have such a huge array of emotions that occur often haphazardly in our, in our brains. He basically suggests that there's a role for dreams in helping us understand how to best react towards emotional situations in our lives.
There are some other wonderful studies in the history of a review of emotions and their role in decision making. And one of the most classic cases that, that you might be aware of is of Phineas Gage. Basically, Gage in the 1800s, he was a railroad worker and he, um, he had a tapping rod that he basically tapped into some, some explosives and it, this, uh, this uh, rod uh, flew through his face. <laughs> And it went uh, right through his left eye and left frontal lobes. Actually, these pictures, I believe the skull is still in Harvard. It's, uh, it's in um, one of the museums, I believe, or some of the pictures are, I'm not quite sure. But what it basically showed is that this fellow who, before he had this experience, was actually pretty jovial, lighthearted, very organized. He was the uh, shift worker. He organized people's schedules. He was very uh, socially connected to his coworkers. After this, and by the way, yes, he did live because the rod shot straight through because it was going so fast and it was hot. It sort of cauterized and on, on the way in and out. And so basically he had, you know, the scars, but he didn't, um, he, he still lived. His body was just fine. But what was different about him was his personality. And if you look online, uh, there's some wonderful videos about a modern day Phineas Gage, which have to do with people who have um, tumors uh, or who have had strokes that have damaged similar areas of the brain. We know that this area of the brain, the frontal lobes, is really highly related to decision making. But what it also is connected to is emotions. Gage could no longer react to happy faces, sad faces, how do you feel, I don't know. So there was no connection between emotions. So people have documented really extensively how he was unable to make decisions. But what is also, and other people have documented how he didn't have emotions. But this idea of connecting these two really big ideas is that there is no decision without um, emotions. And that they do, they are very highly connected even in, in networks in the brain. So how does this actually happen? How do you learn about your world? As Aristotle taught us, you know, you basically have sensory perception. You learn through your senses. And all of this sort of climbs up through your brainstem, gets into your brain, and the first stop it makes is, is it stops really quickly at the uh, amygdala, sort of saying, you know, is this something to be fearful of? Should we run away? Is this going to hurt you? And it goes really quick to the frontal lobes in less than a second, less than a split second, it bounces back and does a double check with the hippocampus. And it says, Really? Is that really what it is? But the first idea is let's get this body, which houses the brain, let's get this body out of here if there's something that's um, going to be dangerous, right? So we know that physiologically speaking, any sense perception is going to make that first stop in the brain to double check with emotions first and then confirm with long-term memory. So um, we know that there's no way that you can avoid, that you bypass that, right? So this is why we know that there's no choice, there's no decision you make in, in your life that can be done without emotions just because of the physiology of how senses pass through the brain. Another example of this, is, as I mentioned, is there are several documented studies of people who've had uh, similar areas of the brain damaged as Phineas Gage uh, and that they show the same kind of uh, difficulties and problems. So let's stop here for a second and think about this, uh, these questions. What happens first? Do you have emotions first? Do you have feelings first? Do you have physical stimuli first? Put these in order. What happens first? First, second, and third. <laughs>